Hello everyone and welcome to my session where I will give you an introduction and tell you everything you need to know about Java's new concurrency model, including all the pitfalls you well, need to avoid when you start using it later this year. My name is David, I'm a senior software developer in the Netherlands, I work at Team Workstars IT. And let's get started with the outline. So I'm going to tell you first about the current situation, what kind of threats do we currently have inside Java, what are we using, how do we use them, and what are the problems that we are facing. And then I will slowly go into virtual threats, what are they, how do they work behind the scenes, and I will show you how you can create a lot of them, because that's what they are really known for. And then when you have a lot of virtual threats, you want to somehow manage the lifetimes, and then we will go into structured concurrency and see how that helps you manage those lifetimes. And at the end, there is some time for a Q&A. So a work of caution. Before we start, I want to tell you that some things might still change. The virtual threads are well, pretty much stable. They're going to be mainstream with Java 21 on September. But uh, the structured concurrency part is still very much in development. So some method names, some return types might still change. But the ideas behind them will be the same. So only, well, it will look a little bit different, but it all will, yeah, like I said, the idea will be, be the same. So let's start with what we have now. Just creating a simple thread inside Java. Who has done something like this before? Ah, that's everybody. That's really great. So what we do here is that we are going to call the thread constructor. We give it a task and what happens is that we are going to the operating system and we ask the operating system, can you create a thread for me that I can use? And the operating system will be like, yes, I can do that, but I will reserve some, uh, some memory around the megabyte for this thread and you can start using it. Because a thread inside Java is just a very thin wrapper around a thread that is managed and scheduled by the operating system. So when the operating system has created the thread for us, we go back into our application, and then we have a thread that we can use, and we just have to call the start method, and our task will be executed. And as you can see, there's a little hint at the top of the slide that says platform threads, and that's because with virtual threads, we now have two kinds of threads that we are, can use inside our application, and it can get a little bit confusing which one uh, are we talking about, because if I'm going to create 10,000 threads uh, of this kind, my system is going to run out of memory. But as we will later see with virtual threads, everything will be fine. And because uh, we want to differentiate between them, we are going to call these threads platform threads. And they are named like that because they are managed as scheduled by the operating system and not by our application itself. So the easiest way to use threads is just to create a thread when we need to. Just for every task that we have, create a single thread that we can use. And while this is very easy for us developers, because we then just don't have to care about scheduling or well, anything at all, just pooling everything, the easiest way is just to create a thread for every task. But while it's easy for us, we have to every time go to the operating system, ask, can you create a thread for me? only to be discarded when we are done with that given task, which isn't that great for the resources, but it's, well, very good for us because it's very easy. So the next best thing is the executor services, because since Java 5, you are encouraged to use the executor services instead of the thread class directly. And what the executor service does, it pulls its threads. So I created the little blue box that well, visualizes my pool, and it has three threads inside of it. And the only thing I have to do is submit tasks to this pool, and when a thread is available, it will pick up the task, it will start running it, and when that task is done, my thread will be put back inside the pool, and it can pick up another task if it's there. But this has some, well, risky things. Like for example, if I have a task that sets a thread local variable, when my thread is put back inside the pool, but I did forget to unset my thread local variable, which, well, sometimes happens, then another task will be able to read my thread local variable from another task. So I'm leaking my variables into other threads, which isn't really that nice. 
And of course, when my threads are blocked, because I'm going to do a database call, then my thread is just blocked, it isn't doing anything, it isn't picking up another task, which is just also a waste of resources. So while I don't have to create a new thread every time uh, I have a task, so it makes better use of the resources, I st it's still not the, yeah, how do I say it? It's not still the best way of going forward. And then async comes in. Async programming g gains some popularity because, well, it makes very good use of the resources. But your entire application has to become an asynchronous application from front to back to make it really worth the effort. And in my opinion, it's very hard to write, even harder to read, especially two weeks after you wrote it. And it's hard to debug because the well, Java is just very focused on its threading. And that's where virtual threads come in. Virtual threads are just an alternative implementation of the thread class. They are not going to replace the threads that we, are, that we already have. We just get a new type of thread that we can use. And the great thing about them is that the operating system doesn't know anything about them. So when we're going to create a virtual thread, we don't have to go to the operating system, we can just stay inside our application. And this has a few advantages, because with the platform threads, we have to allocate some memory of the heap. But with virtual threads, the stack lives inside the heap, which means that we don't have to reserve a lot of memory at the beginning, but we can just grow our stack as we need to. So a virtual thread can just start with just a few bytes of memory. So combining these two advantages of not having to leave my application and starting out with just a very small amount of memory, we can say that these th threads are very cheap to create, which gives me the possibility to create a virtual thread for every task that I have. So then I have my very easy way of programming for every task that I have just created a virtual thread, and it makes very good use of the resources because it almost doesn't use any resources, and especially the memory. And let's try to visualize that memory. So I created two applications. One application used the platform threads, and one, the other one uses virtual threads. And I just started creating, well, different amounts of uh, threads, just to see how much memory does each application use. And as you can see, with the one, 10, and even 100, the platform threads will kind of win. Uh, maybe at 100, uh, they start using a little bit more memory, but it's still not really enough to say, let's rewrite everything to use virtual threads. Because <coughs> the, virtual, uh, the platform threads still shine when you have just a few of them. And we'll see later in the presentation why that is. But when you go into the big numbers, when you're going to use well a large amount of threads, you're going to see that the virtual threads start using almost no memory at all. And even if you, if you have a, a thousand or 10,000 or even a hundred thousand virtual threads, at a maximum it's going to use 200 and around 225 megabytes of memory. And you may be wondering why isn't there a graph for the platform threads? It's because my application crashed. So it doesn't even give you the possibility. But that's enough of the slide. So Let's show you something. There's the mouse. So, like I've said, the threads, the virtual threads are just a alternative implement. Oh, a little bit bigger. This fine for everybody? Ah, great. So, as I've said, the virtual threads are just a alternative implementation. So, I can just use a thread instance to store my virtual threads. But instead of using the constructor, I'm going to use a static builder method called the start virtual thread. And I'm going to give it a task. I'm going to give it a print task. And I'm going to call vt.join to give it a chance to print something to the console. And there it is. Hello, everyone. So this is all you need to get started with just a virtual thread. And then <coughs> with just two lines of code, you have a virtual thread that greets you. 
Well, <coughs> just like that. But it isn't everything. With Java 21, we also get a builder method. And it's called off virtual. As you can see, there is also a off platform, and that will, of course, create a platform thread. But I am interested in virtual thread, so let's use that. And then I can set some properties, like, for example, the name. I'm going to call this VT thread. And I'm going to give it a unstarted task, which is also a prim task. But because it's an unstarted task, I have to call start myself. And just like that, it greets you again, which is really nice. But like I said, with Java, since Java 5, you are encouraged to use the executor services. So with Project Loom, we also get a new executor. And let's create one of those. And it's called the new virtual thread per task executor. And as the name does suggest, it will create a new virtual thread for each task that you submit to it. And as you can see, IntelliJ already well, gives me a hint. I can do something. And that's because the executor services now extend the auto-closable interface, which means that I can use it to cite a try with resource statement. So let's add that. So now I have a try with resource statement. And I can just submit tasks. And let's run it. And then it prints three times, hello everyone. So the great thing about this is that I don't have to join on each of the threads I'm going to create. Because if I want to exit this try, all my threads have to be done running. They either have to have succeeded or failed. What I can't uh, <coughs> exit this try before my virtual threads are done. So now let's do something different and create a lot of virtual threads because that is always very nice. So let's create 10,000 of them. I'm going to submit a sleep task 10,000 times and it will just have a virtual thread sleep for a second just to show you that you can just create 10,000 threads. And it's done running. So in this well, very small amount of time, 10,000 threads all waited one second before I could continue. So let's get back to the slides. Because I just ran 10,000 threads, but I'm also doing it just on the laptop. And as you may expect, it doesn't have 10,000 cores. So how do these virtual threads run? And these virtual threads run on what is called a carrier thread. And a carrier thread is nothing more than just a platform thread designed to run virtual threads. So when I create lots of virtual threads, like I did at the top, I only have, for example, four carrier threads. And you get as many carrier threads as there are uh, threads, or sorry, cores available inside your system. So by default, I will get something like eight carrier threads on this machine. And those eight carrier threads will run all my virtual threads. So how does that even work? And every carrier thread gets its own queue of virtual threads. So each one of my carrier threads gets its own queue that it will work through one by one because it runs uh, in a fork joint pool using a work steaming scheduler which means that if a carrier thread runs out of work, it will just steal a virtual thread from another queue and will start running that instead. So the great thing about this is that now my very expensive resource, my carrier threads, these platform threads, are always doing some work, while these virtual threads, well, they can just wait inside the queue. So how does a virtual, or sorry, how does a carrier thread now when it needs to switch to another virtual thread. And that is done with mounting and unmounting. Here I have a carrier thread, and this carrier thread is running a single virtual thread. And it will just start running and continue running until it encounters a blocking method. And when a virtual thread is blocked, it will be copied, its stack will be copied from the carrier thread back into the heap. 
and the new virtual thread will take its place. So that will be copied from the heap into the carrier thread and the carrier thread will start running that virtual thread. So this is how it all works behind the scenes. But it doesn't always work like that. And I sometimes get the question, how I, am I ever going to use virtual threads during work? And some frameworks already use virtual threads to run their methods, and you only have to well, implement your business code. And with the business code, it is important that you still have a working mounting and unmounting mechanism. And to ensure that, you have to make sure you don't uh, ever pin your virtual threads. And that's used, or well, your virtual threads are being pinned when you call one of those four methods. Because when you enter a synchronized block, you do an object.wait, you make a call to native code, or even some file system operations at, well, to be precise, at some operating systems, not all of them, your virtual thread will be pinned. And then it can't be moved from its carrier thread and it will be stuck. And this will hurt your scalability. Because then your, your carrier thread is also blocked, it's just, just waiting, and it won't run any virtual thread in the meantime, which isn't really that great. And then there are also some pitfalls, which may be not that obvious at first. So, as I've said, when a virtual thread is blocked, only then it will be unmounted. So when you have a long-running calculation, your virtual thread will never be blocked, because it will just continue running. And then it will never be taken off its carrier thread, and it will be stuck. And at that point, you can just use well, the regular platform threads, because you won't see any benefit. Uh, the same goes for pooling virtual threads. Because they are so cheap to create, they are really meant to be well, created on the spot and to just be discarded and not to be pulled. So you have to look out for that. Because there is no use in pooling virtual threads. And of course, the old libraries may not have been adapted yet and may still use those uh, methods that pin your virtual thread to its carrier thread. So you'll have to watch out for that. So now I have created just in the previous demo 10,000 uh, virtual threads, but now how do I manage those lifetimes? And that is done using structured concurrency, or well, I'm going to show you how it's done with structured concurrency. But before I dive deep into what structured concurrency really is, I want to start with something very simple, and that's structured code. This is just a very simple Java method. And when I enter this method A, I'm going to do two calls, one to method B and method C, and I will create some result and return it. So very straightforward. And you can even put it into a simple line. You start with method A, I will do B, C, and a result. Should all be very obvious. And the great thing about it being so clear is that you know exactly what happens when you have an exception. So, for example, if method B throws an exception, your method will stop there. Your parent, uh, this method will be stopped. You will return the error to the caller and let them handle it. You're not going to perform something on C. You're not going to try and create a result because we all know you can't because method B threw an exception. And the same goes for method C. If that throws an exception, you're also not going to try and create a result because it doesn't make any sense. But then we're going to start and st add some threads in it. And then it starts getting a little bit more difficult because then you have this implicit relationship between your two methods. Because I still have my method A, but now method B and C will both run uh, well their code inside uh, a separate thread. And I will just get the result later, which is all very nice, but then when I enter method A, I'm going to both start method B and C, and then I will wait for both my threads to finish before I will continue. And then method B again throws an exception. So now I still have this method C running, this thread is still runs. And when I do the foo.get, I'm like, okay, great, I have a value. And then I will do the bar.get to find out that my well, method threw an exception. And now I have to go back and <coughs> Well, I can't create the result, really. And of course, the same goes for method C. 
but it's a little bit worse this time because now it is method B continues running because when I get uh, because at the return statement I have the full of get so at the get I am blocked I'm waiting till my method B runs uh, so finishes running so if it takes five minutes I'm waiting five minutes at that line code at that line of code only to find out when I do the bar of get that a exception has happened and that I've waited unnecessarily long which could all have been avoided and of course the same goes for when my parent thread throws an exception then I have two methods or two threads running and trying to create a, re uh, well a return value that never is going to be used and I have two threads that are just well loose inside my system that I somehow I have to find out about in the first place and then have to stop myself which is all just a little bit messy and a lot of code I have to write myself and structured concurrency is making this a much easier so let's show you how it's done in a demo so what I want you to focus on is what happens inside this try so structured concurrency in Java is implemented using the uh, structured task scope. Let's zoom in a bit. And just put this a little bit on the side. It's implemented using the structured task scope. And with Java 21, you get two kinds of shutdown policies. And the shutdown policies are the way structured concurrency is implemented. So, as I've said, you get two, and the first one is the shutdown on success. And the shutdown on success policy states, I want to shut down all my threads when the first one has finished. I don't care which one, just the first. And my virtual thread is going to return a string. And then I <coughs> have some code to set it all up. And then I'm going to enter my try. And in the try, I'm going to use the same scope, and using the fork method, I'm going to create two virtual threads, and these virtual threads will immediately start running and return, well, in this case, a string, result one and result two. And when both my threads have started, I'm going to the scope to join. And at the scope to join, my parent thread will block. And so I'm going to wait at this point for both of my virtual threads to finish, or at least the first one. And only then I will continue. So the scope to join is really what enforces the shutdown policy. So when I am past this join, I'm going into my <coughs> into my print line, and this print line, I just get the result from this scope. Because the great thing about this is that af everything after this join, I know that both my virtual threads either are terminated because they didn't finish in time or they succeeded because it was the first thread. So when I run this example, it will print result one, meaning that the first virtual thread one is finished first and the second one is terminated. And as I've said, there are two shutdown policies and the second one is the shutdown on failure. And the shutdown on failure policy really states that either all my threads finish in to uh, together or none of them do. So I'm only interested in a complete result. So again, I set up a scope. And this time I'm going to create two virtual threads using the fork method, but they return a subtask. And a subtask is a reference to this virtual thread, to this value is going to return. And again, I'm going to use a join to wait but to make it a little bit exciting and not the same as the previous example, I'm going to add a join until. And the join until is acts like a deadline. I give my threads 10 seconds to finish. If they don't, I'm going to terminate them myself because they just took too long. And if they finish in time, then I can continue. And like I've said, the showdown on failure. So they either all finish or they don't. So I have to check if a exception has happened. Um, well. And to do that, I use the throw if failed method and it will just retro the exception to the caller. So the caller knows that something happens inside the scope 
and it didn't and it didn't succeed it f and it failed so after the join and the throw failed the the great thing about this is that at this point at this well point in my code i know that all my virtual threads are finished i know they all finished successfully because otherwise i wouldn't have passed the throw or field and i can just get the result using the get method from the subtask and when i run it it will print result one or result two meaning that both my threads finished successfully so for some of you out there too uh, building policies may not be enough and that's when it gets a little bit more interesting and you can create your own uh, policies so as I'm going to show you I'm going to show you a policy that will shut down when I find a product with a price less than 50 so I'm going to start uh, later three threads and they will both uh, all or three of them will try to get a product but I will shut down when a product of 50 has been found so this is awesome code to set it up this is just a record for the product as a integer price and these are the three methods that my virtual threads are going to run as you can see I have a product 50 that will immediately return I have a product 300 that will wait 10 uh, milliseconds and a product of 200 that will also immediately return so let's set this at 5 to make it a bit more interesting and then I'm going to have my own criteria scope and when you extend the structure task scope you can create your own policies the only thing you have to do is really to override this handle on complete method it will be called by every virtual thread that either finished successfully or unsuccessfully and inside this handle complete I'm going to check did my thread finish successfully and is the product that I found less than 100 because if it is I'm going to save this product for later and I can shut down the remaining virtual threads because well I found the product that I wanted and using your own structured task scope is also very straightforward you can just create a try with resource statement create your own criteria scope and fork virtual threads and each of them will eventually call your handle on complete method so the structure uh, really looks the same I'm going to create virtual threads I'm going to join I'm going to block my parent thread until a product has been found but to show you what happens I'm going to print the state of my virtual threads so you know what state they were in when the shutdown method was uh, called or <coughs> what the result of the virtual threads is and then to show you it all works I'm going to show you uh, the result of the, the product that I have found so let's scroll up and run it and as you can see I started three virtual threads two finished successfully and one is unavailable meaning it didn't even start because I already found a product uh, that was worth 50 and then I could exit and to show you that it really found a product there is the result it printed 50 and that is the result from this print line So the pitfall of structured concurrency really is not using it because managing the lifetimes of threads can be very messy and structured concurrency really makes it very easy and straightforward to do it and you don't have to write the code yourself and unit tests and everything it all comes out of the box which is really nice so I've talked a lot about virtual threads and structured concurrency but all you need to get started in well, September with Java 21 are these two methods, the start virtual thread and the new virtual thread executor. Those are all you're going to need in the beginning and to start you out with virtual threads. So I really encourage you to start using them and playing with them and well, experimenting if it works for your use case. 
that was my session and then it's time for questions. There is a mic coming your way. Hello. Uh, about the operations that would uh, the blocking operations that would be avoided, I, man I saw the file system in there. Uh, Which let me go to the slide. Uh, yes. Uh, don't go too far. Uh, this one. Yes. Could yeah. we elaborate a, a touch on this one? Because file system operations are usually one of the main blocking things we would need to do. do yeah, most, more information? Uh, most of the file system operations work. I test uh, a lot of them using uh, Linux and on Windows. But the, uh, the Java enhancement proposal, which describes Project Lumini virtual threads, they still uh, wrote in the last... Uh, well, um, in the last update, it still said there are some uh, file system operations on certain uh, on sy certain systems that still cause the virtual threads to be pinned. I couldn't find them, but if the well, Java enhancement proposal says it, I'm I trusting them and uh, just sounded uh, counterintuitive. That's why. I yeah, there is a um, um, argument that you can pass to your Java application. I don't know it by heart but it will print the uh, uh, virtual thread that's been pinned. So you can just pass the argument and well, try every file system operation you're going to use, and it will print the frames that uh, caused an issue to the virtual thread. So there is a way of finding out if it works uh, for Thank the you. use case. It's Good, you have this slide. Thanks for the, the presentation. Uh, when you did the demo about this, the sleep operation went very well, even though you might have a feeling it's blocking anyway. So is there any, well, how, how did it work? Uh, how it works? Yeah. Uh, the virtual thread, when it is blocked, it will be well, copied from its carrier thread. It will be taken off and it will just be put back inside the heap there is, um, um, I think it works like the coroutines where it's, uh, it yields and then after it, it will be put back inside in the same state. But I'm not that deep into the, I never went that deep into the GVM. Because my next question would have been, could we use the same mechanism to write our own code on blocking operations? Uh, I think it's all shielded off. But there is a preview version of Java. I think it was 19 or 20, some early access build, where it all was available. But I don't know if it's on the roadmap to be available again. It depends on the people at Oracle if they want to uh, include that. Thank you. Oh, if there aren't any more questions then thank you for being here. <laughs>